I grew up in a film family, specifically my mother was a script supervisor and she married a man who was my stepfather and he was a production mixer. But we uh, did a lot of music. We grew up in a musical environment. My stepbrothers and I played a lot of music and mixing became part of it in a big way. So I actually had a music path for a long time. But being around the film industry, at one point a summer job came along and said, would you like to work on a film set? And I never went back. When I started spending real professional time on a film set, I'd been through the music portion, so I'd been in recording studios for quite a long time. I showed up on a film set knowing what it was like, but having seen a higher end of recording, or at least what Post offered for film, it opened my eyes to what we were doing on a film set. I'm different, I would think, from other mixers in that uh, a classic old style would be simply to record only everything on camera, or and if we slightly sent something would be close to the lens we would record it. I take it from a very different standpoint in that I see an entire scene from one piece. I try to record every angle the same way, meaning I always record on and I always record off camera dialogue. Off camera dialogue will not get in the way of the technical aspects, but most of the time it doesn't need to, especially if we're committed to wireless or lavaliers as well as the booms. Parenthood in general, we run multi-camera. But we're always contending with a wide, a medium, and a tight, a medium to tight, and a tight. So we'll look at the scene from that perspective. What ends up happening a lot is the scene morphs from there, and the physical activity from the original rehearsal then changes. And that's what determines how we'll mix it and who's going to wear the wires where. A very important part is the physical activity. Are they going to talk to their right in the car most of the time? Are they going to hug and kiss? Are they going to carry a bag? What's going to go on will determine where we place it, which will then determine an EQ, because certainly from here to here is going to change. I don't EQ really any voice until it becomes really affected by the mic placement. Um, and that's a big discussion. You have to know what's going on. And the big job for Ron is to avoid the clothes, get them in the right position so they're open enough to sound like his microphone. My boom operators are advantaged that I, or, or, or have an advantage that I was a boom operator myself for a long time in a day where we couldn't rely on wireless. Uh, wireless came about and we started relying on them and some people too heavily. Boom operators can get things that a wire will never get. He can look to the right and see somebody in a non-contract controlled environment and always save it. We can save wider ideas. We can mix up front. I can't look in somebody's eyes as a mixer and know that they're going to cry and go quiet or know that they're going to explode. Uh, when I was a boom man, I, I preserved the, the area for these people and I also have to get into their faces to wire them now. So nowadays, my boom man has to have a certain social element that is crucial to keeping our cast with us. I record multi-track, single element per everybody on the film set, and I really look not to loop anybody. From the West Wing to this show, Parenthood, what I work on now, which is a big cast, there's 14 regular characters, that any number of them will show up at any time. They always improvise, they always paraphrase, and we rarely stay on book as a classic character term, but we don't loop. We only don't loop because, again, we have individual tracks for everybody, and we, we, we manage them. For, part, for Parenthood and for most of the shows that I do, um, I use a classic setup of sound in that I like an analog board that feeds a two-track machine. That said, at all times I have a multi-track recorder which has gone over to non-linear. I roll with Mac minis, I roll with laptops as a backup, and it's uh, limited only by the number of, of uh, inputs that you can aggregate. I think one of the multi-track aspects of Parenthood has uh, given the producers confidence in me to record live music. We've had a lot of musicians come into the studio and our showrunner, Larry Trilling, really loves the live sound. A lot of the storyline involves the band starting up or, or stopping, so a pre-recorded uh, element of that is rarely useful. Uh, my music background, going to Berklee College of Music, having a lot of multi-track involved in my fingers uh, allows me to, to provide that. We don't do it on the sound card if we don't have to. I have a Task MDM 3200 with a bunch of preamps we'll bring in. We classically rock and roll mic the studio. 
To a certain extent, as I uh, always come up against, is the camera needs to see the drummer in the same room as the vocalist. So I mix that, I'm a production mixer element in music and make these live uh, recordings happen. But almost all of the, pr the projects we've had to Parenthood, they've been able to use the live recorded sound in the background. So when you're cutting your elements back and forth, you've had a live sound. It's been somewhat limited to how I can acoustically deal with it. But, but we always do a lot of multi-track live records, multi-passes um, with some cool art. It's, it's really fun because it, it takes me back to my musical days and I'm now a, a, a rock and roll multi-track engineer with my sound car recording dialogue behind us all sunk together. I think sound is part of any one of those jobs that you'd like to be in the capture place and have a passion for. That said, I think the good sound not just recorders, but boom men in general, good sound people, production film people, do have a musical background. And one of the best places to learn to listen to different elements at the same time is in music. Pulling a cello from a violin, pulling a harp from a glockenspiel and being able to name them and know what they're doing is what our job is about. I hear the plane, I hear the car, but I'm listening to the character up front, I'm hearing are the footsteps differently. And being able to differentiate between those two and having a passion for differentiating those two will make you a sound person. Production sound can never be allowed to be a track on some machine that's just going to get itself. You have to have people that care about sound. I find that the best sound doesn't come from the best technicians. It comes from the best technicians that really care about sound. It's a different element. Um, you can analyze it spectrally, it has similarities, but at that point, how I deal with somebody and how a cameraman deals with somebody is very different. Sound is really the other half of capture. It's not the other third of capture. Sound is really important. If you can't hear the joke at the end of the, the scene going out the back of the door, you can't get the scene. The scene is over. It'll have to be looped. Somebody will fix it. But if it has to be done again and it was magic on the moment, it won't be done the same way. So if you're passionate about it, you can get it at the, t at the time and you don't have to worry about getting it later. The sound team has felt like an island amid an ocean of visualists for many, many years. And it's, it's an absolute misnomer. It's a big mistake to, to think that the audio element of capture isn't part of the element. And, and I probably learned that most transitioning from music into dialogue, having seen dialogue in the way it was treated politically before. And you mentioned very interestingly that don't try to touch on the negative. And it's part of my career to stop that negative, to treat the rest of the crew with the respect that you'd like to be given in that I'm here to do the same job. And that's a really different one because they think you're a boom guy and you're making shadows. They think you're a sound guy and you're asking for a close-up, whatever it is to do it. Well, no, actually we're trying to get a good track and we're trying to make the actors get their most comfortable performance. And I was told by Michael Mann, or actually indirectly to Adam Greenberg, on Insider. It was a very interesting situation where we're in the smallest box you can imagine filming. And he turned to the director of photography, Adam Greenberg, and said, don't box me in. And he was a bit annoyed at the time, but the point was the actors needed to turn to their right and step a couple of steps. And though we were inside the smallest box, he was saying to all of us that the actors are what we serve and they don't serve you. And television is a new big world that has all always had marks and spots and what we do, but no, we're here to give a creative area or a creative environment for the creatives to do that, and it's a technical servitude. So the sound department is 100% part of the film department. The film department involves the sound department, though they don't understand what we do a lot of the time, that therein lies the problem with it. Most of the time it's communication uh, and just simply understanding what one another does. I try to understand their side more so so I can compliment them and I know what you're doing and I give it validity by knowing what you do. And I hope that they would do it for us and I work on that, I really do.